start recording and start streaming. Yeah. I think that should work. Now I'm going to have to send out the link again to everyone because unfortunately um, it's going to be a different link and nobody knows where I am since I'm not on the original channel. Alright, let me see here. Get this open, get this open, get this open. Yeah, okay. I think. Yes. Okay, so give me the link. Copy the link, copy the link, copy the link. Alright then. <clears throat> so, um, uh, before I was so rudely interrupted, we had actually started this show with the first segment, and unfortunately, huh, uh, my uh, Ethernet decided to crap out on me. Uh, so if you, anyone out there is still waiting for me to come back, I hope you're paying attention to the various social media uh, where I will link the new link right there. And, yeah, okay. So, as I was saying earlier... Uh, welcome to the uh, fourth episode of Lives Pre-Saints. Um, this episode is called Gusto for uh, Project Oxcart's Archangel. Uh, those who don't know what the references are, I'm going to ask you to look it up because I'm trying to get things going again here. Um, but basically, uh, Project Oxcart was the uh, CIA project to design a new uh, sort of spy plane uh, in the 1960s, and um, they initially called it uh, Gusto, or G-U-S-T-O, uh, and then changed the name to Oxcart, and uh, the project itself was called uh, Archangel, the, the project to, to develop this A-12 aircraft. Um, so anyway, uh, as, as I was saying, we, we, I do have with me a, a very special guest, co-hostess this evening, uh, which makes the show a very special show. Um, so very special guest co-hostess, would you care to introduce yourself again? Yes, once again, <laughs> I am Anna Hada Hearts. How you doing, guys? Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Fucking Verizon, man, I tell you what. Um, so. Oh, I got front care, it's no better. Yeah, they're all <laughs> messed up now. Um, and we will talk about that at some point uh, in these stories. Uh, I'm just going to jump right back in. This week, Bowsette has continued to take the internet by storm. And the Super Crown has been applied to other characters from the Mario universe, including Swamp, Luma, Boo, Yoshi, Piranha Plant, Goomba, and others. What's more, the phenomenon has spread to other games and anime. However, this fan creation appears to have been considered by Nintendo even before fans came up with the idea, as we find from various gaming outlets, including Nintendo Life and Eurogamer. Um, so... <clears throat> um, from Nintendo Live, the article Super Mario Odyssey Art Book Reveals Official Bowsette Concept existed long before the fan-made one, It's Kind of a Thing. This is by Liam Doolin, uh, published a few days ago. Um, and there's an image that it shows of Bowsette, their official version. I'm not going to post it in the stream because I don't know about the uh, copyright uh, nature of it. But anyway, a few days ago, a Nintendo spokesperson said the company had nothing to say about drawings and other and quote other things end quote uploaded to the internet. This was a response to a question about social media superstar Bowsette. That wasn't enough to stop one fan from starting a petition to make the fan-made character a legitimate thing, asking for her inclusion as a trophy in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. The latest news related to the subject of Bowsette this time comes from an official Nintendo source. Twitter user Sakusuru has 
tweeted an interesting photo of a Super Mario Odyssey art book that has just been released in Japan. Inside is allegedly a scrapped concept of Bowser, who has taken over Peach's body with his own version of Cappy. As can be seen in the image, she's basically the official Nintendo version of Bowsette created long before the fan-made one. And this person, now at Sakusuru, tweeted out, so in the art of Super Mario Odyssey that came out in Japan today, there is a scrapped concept of Bowser taking over Peach's body with his own version of Cappy. Kind of surreal how there could have been an official Bowser long before the fan one took over the internet. And that was tweeted on the 28th of September. <clears throat> in case you haven't heard about Bowser, the character became a superstar on social media over the past week when an illustrator located in Malaysia tweeted a comic featuring the Peach and Bowser mashup inspired by an item set to appear in New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Well, okay, so, I mean, there is another article here, but we're running a bit short on time now since I had to restart uh, the stream, so we'll skip to the next article then. Uh, if you would like to read what Venture Beat has to say. <laughs> well, I can say, like, I'm definitely, like, a huge fan of the whole Bowser thing. You you are a fan like, of the... really... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I, well, okay, it brings... I'm a huge weeb. Like, I'm, I am a huge weeb. Like, it's... A lot of people don't really know that, but I am a huge weeb. Uh, I'm a fan of, of the anime kitties, and <laughs> as soon as this as soon as this hit the fucking internet, I'm like, okay, what did I just see? And then it spread to all of these different characters, and I'm I, I'm as an artist really happy to see people just like flex their art skills and like all come together in this one like art related meme sort of thing. But it's kind of interesting to hear that like the company itself did have like sort of a prototype of a similar character already. Mm -hmm, yeah. I actually, uh, at first, I was a bit dismayed over it because people kept posting these these uh, pieces of art in the NSFW channels, and I'm like, but there's, there's nothing NSFW about it. And then they actually started posting some, you know, Rule 34 materials, so there was, <laughs> you know, something NSFW about it. But it, it annoyed me at first because I was like, quit, <laughs> quit shitting up the NSFW channel with this stuff. And uh, But, you know, it wasn't that I didn't like it because I do, in fact, I thought it was a pretty cool little concept. And uh, I... I will say, I will go on record as saying that I prefer the orange-haired Bowsett to the blonde-haired Bowsett. Um, but then we've also yeah, got... Yeah, I have seen the... Yeah, I, I do like it. I do. I, I think I might like it a little better myself. <laughs> uh, we do have a, uh, you know, we have Wampad and a few dark-haired um, um, Ets as well. Uh, so, and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm always partial to my own hair color, I guess. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. Anything close to red? Like, I've been doing the red in my hair for, for a, a year or two now. Mm -hmm. has, it been, has it been a few years? I don't, know. I don't know. I had my hair dyed black for like 10 years, so now that I've had it red for as long as I have, I'm like, how long has it been now? But like, anytime I get close to that with a character, I'm like, yes, more red <laughs> So did you want to read from the Venture Beat article, or shall I? Uh, I could do it. Uh, where can I find it? It's in the show notes channel. Show notes. Show notes. Venture Very Beat. bottom. Venture Beat. Writers, USA Today, DPS. Verge. Not too far back now. I see it. LA Time, CNN Money, Reuters, USA Today, CBS. I don't see it. Uh, let's see. It's um. I have a look and see if I can find it here. <clears throat> it's uh. It says uh. It's right under the very first two pictures. The pictures that are the official concept art. 
Venture Beat reports that Bowsett searches went from zero to 500,000 in just three days on Pornhub. Oh, oh, it's up a bit. Okay, hold on. Houston Chronicle, BBC. It's right above that Houston Chronicle article about the... Uh, mm, let's not spoil it. <laughs> Venture Beat, there it is. I found it. Jeffrey Grubb in Bright White Letters. It took me a second. <laughs> it was up a bit. Okay, so Venture Beat. Pornhub. Bowsette searches went from zero to 500,000 in three days. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you horny bricks. <laughs> All right, it says the Bowsette thirst is real. Over the last week, the new Nintendo fan creation has destroyed our perception of reality. And now people have taken a porn hub and you poured in search of mature content related to the mashup of Bowser and Peach. That is factually incorrect. It's not Bowser and Peach. Uh, Bowsette crashed into our collective consciousness earlier this week. She is the creation of webcomic author Haniwa. That artist took inspiration from the Super Crown power up in the upcoming new Super Smash Bros. U Deluxe. This turns the Toadette character into a mashup of Peach and Toadette called Peachette. In Hanwha's version, uh, Bowser puts on the crown to turn into a dark version of Peach with horns. And where can we look at yeah. Fans immediately dubbed her Bowsette, and the internet fan art factory got to work in a nearly unprecedented way. Now Bowsette lovers around the world are scouring Pornhub for her. I'll give it a little bit. The, the, the cosplay porn uh, sector will get to it eventually, I'm sure. Oh, yes, they already uh, have. Unprecedented thirst. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I follow a lot of those uh, those lewd uh, cosplayers because, like, mm -hmm. they're talented and they're hot. Like, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, like, a few of them, like, within days of this uh, hitting the internet and becoming the, the viral meme that it became, uh, they, within a couple of days, already had, like, banged out a cosplay, and I'm like, I'm waiting for it. I'm just waiting for the cosplay <laughs> for it. It's, it's just going to take a little bit at this point. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway, uh, unprecedented thirst. Uh, on September 22nd, no one had ever searched Pornhub for Bowsette. No, because it wasn't a concept yet. By September 26th, that had changed drastically. Quote, Bowsette searches appeared first on September 23rd and they grew exponentially, reads Pornhub's blog post. On September 26, 323,179 people searched for Bowsette on Pornhub. <laughs> and yeah, they show a little graph where it went from like fucking nothing. Out. Apparently there was already a Bowser search. That went up a, a tick <laughs> on the 23rd. Guys, <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, 51,882 people by September 26th had uh, looked for Bowser just by itself. <laughs> That's pretty funny. What the shit? <laughs> and, and then it said uh, uh, 323,179 by the, the 26th for Bowser. Wow. Uh, Jesus, you, 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 you horny, depraved, degenerate souls. I, I... <laughs> Salute you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Classic Bowser also saw some more love on Pornhub according to the site. Uh, quote, while a few hundred people were already searching for Bowser on a daily basis. Okay, full stop. A few hundred people were already searching for Bowser. Really? Guys? I, guys. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> guys. Internet. I need to have a talk with you. Anyway. Uh, his searches reached as high as 51,882 on September 26, reads the blog. Uh, the uh, sorry, dynamic got over 500,000 porn hub searches in just over 72 hours. Uh, Uporn saw similar growth for Bowsette. Searches grew 5,849% from September 22nd to the 25th. Yeah, geez, wow, okay, yeah. That is, uh, that is a graph. And, uh, wow. Wow, yeah. Guys, just some fucking degeneracy. <laughs> okay. Right. Well. 
Oh, there we, there's a there's an end to this. So what are people looking for when they look for Bowser? According to Pornhub, uh, it's exactly what you expect. That includes Bowser porn, Bowser hentai, and Bowser cosplay. And searches for Bowser include girl Bowser and hot girl Bowser. No <laughs> word yet on how Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto feels about all this. Uh, though there was a tweet from the uh, parody Shigeru Miyamoto quote uh, uh, account on Twitter. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it did indeed say something about uh, something being a mistake. So, <laughs> I, oh my part God. of me, part of me, fully embraces this, and for, part of me absolutely says it. <laughs> it's it's certainly an interesting phenomenon, no doubt about it. <clears throat> so, in somewhat related news, <laughs> um, Houston's mayor wants to stop what's being called a robot brothel from opening. This is from the Houston Chronicle by Mike Morris and Olivia P. Tollett. Um, Houston Chronicle. When I lived in Houston, there were two newspapers, the Chronicle and the Post, and uh, we always took the Chronicle, so uh, I, I still um, follow them on the internet. I get a, a news... Um, update thing from them several times a day. Well, I find uh, local town news sources tend to be a bit more reliable than, like, larger ones mm -hmm. for, for regional shit. Uh, so this says, Houston City Council may move to block robot brothel from opening near Galleria. Now, Galleria, uh, I don't even know if the mall is still in operation, but it was a, a rather large mall. It was probably the largest mall in Houston when, when we left there, but that's been quite some time ago. Um, and I know that malls are closing all over the country nowadays. So oh, all over the place. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bit disappointing because, I mean, I used to love to... I was a mall rat, sure. Everybody uh, wanted to go to the mall and hang out and, you know, just stand around in there and talk. And I remember going... Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit younger than you, and I similarly, like, I had a bit of time where I hung out when I was... Yeah, we used to go, um, when I was in my undergrad days, we would go up and and take um, a bunch of beers in cans because we were um, uncultured savages who didn't know better, <laughs> and stuff them into our pockets and, and go around outside the mall and drink one after another and then go back in the mall and stand around trying to stay upright while we were blitzed. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't really drinking that back when I used to hang out at the mall, but I would totally... At the mall down the way from me, uh, in the next town over, they used to have this place called Digital Mayhem, which was essentially just a, like, a LAN party. Mm -hmm. It was basically a LAN party. Like, somebody set up the space in the mall where they put a bunch of computers in it, and there was a DDR machine all the way in the back, and all of it was on a LAN, uh, a LAN system, and you could play with people uh in the actual facility itself and during the week it was like pay to play like for hour or whatever for hours or whatever but on friday nights they did it you paid a certain amount and you could play unlimited on any computer all night so the place was naturally packed as fuck so it got to the point where i got to be such close friends with the owner of the place where he just let me in after a while because if he ever had any issues with anybody he would send me after them and they would get the fuck out <laughs> So, um, I would go in there sometimes just because, because I've, been, I, I've smoked weed for a very long time. I would go in there just stone out of my mind sometimes. Oh, yeah. And just, <laughs> just go in there and play video games and shit. I can remember on more than one occasion playing, like, RTS games against other people, and I'm kind of good at, like, real-time strategy, so... Like, all of a sudden, you'd hear just a group of people just groan because all of a sudden they all got wiped off the fucking map, and I'm just sitting there just finding resources. And, <laughs> uh, it, was good, it was good times. It was good times. But yeah, the, I, the mall at, uh, the, down the way from me, they've had so many businesses come and go since then now, and I've, I've mm -hmm. watched the slow decline of that mall. It's not to the point of where it's about to shut down yet, but I have seen like a, 
like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an acquaintance with a YouTuber by the name of Alpha Omega Sin who lives down in Philadelphia, or not Philadelphia, but Pennsylvania. Uh, and he posts pictures of uh, this mall that was about to close and there's barely a single store left in the place and it looks like he's the only one in it. Like, it, it's, it's directly because of the internet. Goodness, goodness. Yeah, I know. I, I we, um, yeah, I, I spent a bit of time in uh, those mall arcades and our our um, student union building arcade uh, uh, after ingesting some green smoke. Uh, my game was always Joust. I don't know if that was still around when you were visiting the arcades, but it was. Uh, uh, you were. What uh, was it? Joust. Just now. You are a character with a, a lance made of some kind of apparently laser-like light. So it was like a lightsaber turned into a lance. And you're riding on the back of this pterodactyl-like creature. And you have to fight uh, you know, NPCs that are also pterodactyls. But it did have a two-player mode so you could, you know team up with another person and fight these NPCs or you could fight the other person and it was a pretty cool game I got to the point where I could just play it for hours and hours and hours on one quarter and eventually I would just have to walk away and <laughs> you know let all the extra lives get killed or, or turn it over to someone else but oh, so anyway this um, <clears throat> the Galleria was, was and may still be a mall in, in Houston mm super huge mall it was the largest of all back in those days um so uh mayor sylvester turner of houston will ask the city council this week to change houston's rules on sexually oriented businesses a change that could prevent a so-called robot brothel from opening near the galleria toronto-based kinky stalls kinky's dolls kinky's dolls i guess had announced plans to open a Houston branch where adult love dolls constructed of synthetic skin and highly articulated skeletons would be available to rent before you buy. City inspectors, however, have stopped work at the company's chosen storefront at Richmond and Chimney Rock, saying a renovation job <clears throat> had begun there without the proper permits in place. If the council agrees to bring such a shop under its sexually oriented business, regulations this week the business could be prevented from opening at that location entirely uh, traditional sexually oriented businesses such as strip clubs long have been prevented from operating within 1500 feet of churches schools daycares parks and residential neighborhoods the city-owned anderson park is just a few hundred feet from kinky's dolls proposed storefront i um uh, let's see um <coughs> District Councilman Mike Laster tweeted, quote, I stand ready to work with Turner City Departments and District J citizens to stop this unwanted business. District J deserves better, end quote. The portion of the ordinance Turner wants to revise addresses adult arcades where customers view adult content using an arcade device, the council would amend the definition of an arcade device to include not just machines displaying video, but also, quote, anthropomorphic devices or objects, end quote, and would prohibit, quote, entertainment with one or more persons using an arcade service on the premises, end quote. In short, the business could sell the dolls at its proposed location, such models reportedly sell for about $4,000, but repeated use rentals would be banned. Uh, mayoral spokesman Alan Bernstein said, quote, because the proposed ordinance change is not aimed at any particular location, it was, draft uh, <clears throat> it was drafted without regard to Kinky's dolls, end quote. So, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Well, I just want to say, like, looking at these dolls, number one, they're hitting me just a touch in the uncanny valley. Uh huh. They're a little weird. They're 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 a bit weird. Um, like if if they were a little more human looking, uh, it probably wouldn't make it any better. 
it would probably make it worse in fact. Uh, let's see. Like, okay, this blonde chick, yeah, that looks like a not real human. This, this, yeah, they look, they look like you're fucking. Uh, they look, it looks like you're fucking life size Barbies. Yeah. It looks like. Well, I noticed uh, that. Which I mean, you know, to each their own. I don't want to king shame anybody. I'm, I'm as, as progressive as the next fucking person, <laughs> but like, Jesus Christ, it's weird. They look weird. Yeah, they do. Oh, I noticed that the uh, the dark haired model had uh, rather oversized, shall we say, um, mammaries, <laughs> and such a the tiny, what now? tiny little waist. The oversized breasts and a tiny, tiny little waist. So, I mean, okay, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not too bad. Well, uh, let's see. okay. So the the blonde one at the beginning. Uh, the uh, the slideshow here. She looks like a person, only rubber. Yeah. Uh, the the black haired one looks like about my proportions. If I get back to working out and lose about fifteen pounds right now. Uh mm -hmm. This close up on the brunette. Uh, the the chestnut brown hair here. She, it's like you took a a better drawn anime one from her in life, and then the last one looks like oh God. What was her? Name? What was the name of that chick from the the nineties, early two thousand? Anna Nicole Smith. Oh, she was yeah. like Anna Nicole Smith when she wasn't fat. Hmm. And she looks like she'll she'll steal your grandpa too. So. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say I don't know. I, I as far as the business itself, um, I uh, like most people in the Green Party do support uh, legalization of sex work. So uh, I mean, it would uh, yeah. do away with trafficking and uh, pimps, uh, which are the really bad aspects of that type of work. Um, but I don't know if this counts really because these aren't human beings, right? <laughs> so I would consider it just to be a, a humanoid shaped sex toy. I'm Which in that case, like, Mike okay, well, then you have to have some sort of thing in regulation for sex clubs, and don't sex clubs still exist in some places? Yeah, they like, certainly do in Houston, uh, for example. But my, I think I think my biggest concern really is automation that they're taking jobs from real people you know <laughs> yeah right but i don't you think some bitches out there on the <laughs> i don't but think i don't think fine give them give them tax breaks in a far away day god damn yeah but i don't <laughs> think i don't think houston is ready for legal real human uh, well, brothels either <laughs> no, i mean I'd texas say start that off in california better, yeah. but god shit Texas? Well, they got the one area in Nevada already, but like right, right. Uh, Texas state government is Baptist-ridden. That's the way I generally describe it. So oh. it's going to take a while for them to come into the 21st century. Um, They're still trying to figure out whether or not they want to keep women in skirts, like. Sure. Uh huh. <laughs> so then, uh, okay, you want to take the next article? Uh, the one after. That? Moving from the BBC. Uh, yes. Okay, hold on, let's see. Let me see, I don't pay, I haven't been paying much attention to the news or social media that much in the last, like, week or so, because I had some real, like, hardcore depression going on, so I was like, yeah, let's just fuck off with all this. So what did U.S. and Canada reach a new trade deal to replace NAFTA? Okay, so Trudeau's not trying to flex anymore? No. Let's see, relations between Donald Trump... Well, first of all, like anybody, anybody that goes onto national television while talking to one of the youngest and most prolific humanitarians, Malala Yousafzai, on national television while wearing ducky socks, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I I get I get you I get you a little bit, Trudeau, but you're a grown man politician on national television with with a little girl that got shot in the 
fucking head trying to give uh, Pakistanis women the you know trying to fight for them to get the right to an education. Mm-hmm. And you're wearing ducky socks. <laughs> she's better dressed than you at that point. Uh, he's a and squirrely. He's, half your fucking age. <laughs> he's a squirrely little guy in general, I think. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I've talked to several Canadians, and the ones that lean more right uh, than, than some others say that uh, they believe that Trudeau was voted in because he's pretty. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that. Uh, I have heard Trudeau's platform. I agree with a portion of it, because it sounds like a good portion of what the progressive platform Used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, all right. Transgr- uh, digressions aside. Uh, uh, there we go. The U.S. and Canada have reached a new trade deal, along with Mexico, to replace the current North American Free Trade Agreement, otherwise known as NAFTA. The United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA, gives the U.S. greater access to Canada's dairy market and allows extra imports of Canadian cars. Oh, fucking no, Canada made cars. Uh, the deal has 34 chapters and governs more than one TM. Is that trillion? Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, I guess. Okay. One trillion. We'll say one trillion. Uh, 767 billion pounds, or you uh, dirty lobster backs, in trade. Uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, who has long sought to change NAFTA, said the New Deal was, quote, wonderful. Until recently, it looked as if Canada could be excluded from a final trade agreement to replace NAFTA, which has been in place since 1994. Uh, I'm six. Goddamn. Uh, the new USMCA is intended to last 16 years and be reviewed every six years. And be, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a grammar Nazi that calls a sentence. Uh-huh. Uh, following the agreement, Mr. Trump tweeted that USMCA was a, quote, great deal for all three countries and solves the deficiencies and mistakes in NAFTA. And then we had a Trump tweet saying, uh, late last night, our deadline, we reached, all right, hold on. Late last night, our deadline, <laughs> we reached a wonderful new trade deal with Canada to be added into the deal already reached with Mexico. The new name will be the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA. It is a great deal. Okay, okay, I'm starting to go burning now. It is a great deal for all three countries. Solves the many. Uh, Follow up tweet. Uh, def- what? You know this motherfucker <laughs> tweets like a twelve year old who knows what an ellipsis is for. Jesus Christ! Uh-huh. The deficiencies and mistakes in NAFTA greatly opens markets to our farmers and manufacturers, reduces trade. Uh, barriers to the U.S. and will bring all three great nations together in competition with the rest of the world. The USMCA is a historic transaction, according to uh, to Donnie there. Uh, the U.S. has been fighting trade war on several fronts this year, including placing tariffs on steel and aluminum ports from Mexico and Canada. I'm sorry, aluminum. I fucked that one As part of President Trump's America First policy. Uh, tariffs on cars are also threatened. So I guess tariffs on cars are still currently threatened, according to that verbiage. All right, well, uh, somebody who has no idea what any of the fuck of any of that means... We're going to go on and and talk about... We're going to go on with a couple more stories about it to give some more detail. Um, Okay. So we can dive into commentary on it afterwards. So I'm going to take the next one. Um, it's not just Trump, uh, surprisingly, uh, who seems to be pleased with the new trade pact. So we have an article from uh, 
City News, 1130, uh, which is called Trudeau praises UM, USMCA as government prom promises compensation for dairy farmers by Cormac McSweeney and the Canadian Press, published on the 1st of October. <coughs> In Ottawa, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has praised the USMCA, the new trade deal Canada has signed with the US and Mexico, though not without criticism at home. Trudeau spoke with reporters along with Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland after, ta after landing the major trade breakthrough last night, just before a US-imposed deadline. After 14 months of tough negotiations, the Prime Minister framed this agreement as a victory. He said, quote, it will be good for Canadian workers, good for Canadian business, and good for Canadian families, end quote. He said this deal, which will revamp the old NAFTA, uh, protects supply management, staves off auto tariffs, and maintains fair hearings in any disputes with our large neighbor to the south. But the opposition parties are questioning that. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer says to him, the liberals appear to have caved to demands from the Trump administration. Scher says, quote, the prime minister has made major concessions on key areas. He's made concessions on dairy, he's made concessions on auto quotas, and he's made concessions on pharmaceuticals, meaning that Canadian patients will have to pay higher drug costs. Now, we would have hoped that after making all those concessions, we would be able to see a gain on an important issue like Buy American, end quote. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh elaborates on Andrew Scheer's points and says that the costs of prescription drugs will go up under the new agreement. Quote, that, man's people, uh, that means people suffering from chronic illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, will see an increase in the cost of medication. End quote. Dairy farmers, too, are angry with the concessions made to grant the U.S. more access to our market. In a news release, Dairy Farmers of Canada say they are deeply disappointed about Canada's concessions in New Deal. Quote, the announced concessions on dairy in the new USMCA deal demonstrates once again that the Canadian government is willing to sacrifice our domestic dairy production when it comes time to make a deal. End quote. Pierre Lampron, the lobby group's president, says. <clears throat> he goes on to say, quote, The government has said repeatedly that it values a strong and vibrant dairy sector. They have once again put that in jeopardy by giving away more concessions, end quote. After trade deals with the Euro bloc and Pacific Asian countries in the last two years, Canada's dairy lobby says the new North American deal weakens the domestic dairy sector. Uh, the release adds, quote, USMCA follows two previous trade agreements in which access to the Canadian dairy market was granted, CETA, C -E -T -A, and the CPTPP, which sacrificed the equivalent of a quarter of a billion dollars annually in dairy production to industries in other countries, end quote. Freeland said they will be compensated for their losses, quote, that is the fair thing to do, end quote. She said the amount and the type of compensation will be worked out in coming months. Trudeau said the USMCA is successful in maintaining fairness and balance between Canada and the U.S., a trading partner ten times its size. Despite his praise for the deal, <coughs> Excuse me. He uh, cautioned that we are not at the finish line yet, as the agreement still needs to be ratified by all three countries. Both Freeland and Trudeau said it's important to remember that when the negotiations began over a year ago, the U.S. aim was to dismantle supply management entirely, and Canada did not let that happen. Trudeau noticeably did not mention U.S. President Donald Trump in his opening remarks, saying only in answer to a direct question that the relationship with the president has been challenging during the course of negotiations. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Imagine my shock. Indeed, indeed. All right, so then uh, you want to take a look at what's different in the new trade deal with the next article. Uh, yeah, yeah, here we are. The NBC one, yeah? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, Tyler, Liz, here are some key differences between Trump's new trade deal and NAFTA. We got some bullet points here. Uh, the Trump administration's new deal with Canada and Mexico leaves much of the old North American free trade agreement intact. Uh, there are some key differences, however, particularly when it comes to the dairy and auto industries. And the updated agreement, the subject of more than a year of intense negotiations between the three countries, includes some high-profile compromises from both Washington and Ottawa. All right, uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, the Trump's administration, uh, Trump, sorry, Trump administration's new deal a new trade deal with Canada and Mexico leaves much of the old North American free trade agreement intact. There are some key differences, however, particularly when it comes to the dairy and auto industries. Uh, the updated agreement, the subject of more than a year of intense negotiations between the countries, includes some high-profile compromises from both Washington and Ottawa. The U.S., for example, won expanded access to Canadian markets for U.S. dairy producers, long a major sticking point for the Trump administration. For its part, Canada won a key concession from U.S. negotiators that preserved a dispute resolution process. The updated agreement also includes key provisions governing the auto industry that will encourage more U.S. car production while protecting Canadian and Mexican companies from President Donald Trump's threats of wider U.S. tariffs. Oh, one second. There you go. I had to do a cough. Uh, here's a quick look at key provision. It will require 70% auto components to be built in North America, up from 62.5%. Also, 40 to 45 percent of auto components will have to be made by laborers, making at least $16 an hour, uh, which that, that, that sounds cool to me. Cool. Uh, in a concession to Mexican and Canadian business, the deal largely exempts passenger vehicles, pickup trucks, and auto parts from possible Trump administration tariffs, and U.S. farmers are getting slightly more access to Canadian dairy markets. Uh, Trump had long threatened to scrap the deal in full, so the changes and the rebranding offered the president a chance to laud the deal as a promise fulfilled. Quote, throughout the campaign, I promised to renegotiate NAFTA. And, yeah, to be fair, he did. And today we have kept that promise, Trump said Monday in announcing the deal. Later in the day, he pushed back on the notion that it's merely an updated version of the previous pact. Uh, another quote, it's not NAFTA redone, it's a brand new deal, the president said during a news conference in the White House Rose Garden. The deal is subject to approval by Congress. Well, of course, everything's subject to approval by Congress. Uh, a question of impact. <clears throat> uh, the sweeping agreement includes hundreds of pages, covering thousands of individual products. While the updated provisions will have an impact on these specific companies or industries covered, the updated agreement is expected to have little overall economic impact. My expectation all along was that there would be few major changes, and NAFTA would go from being one of the worst deals ever to the one of the best, said Jim O'Sullivan, an economist, econ economist at High Frequency Economics. One of the biggest changes to the deal involves the name Trump. Uh, involves one of the biggest changes to the deal involves oh one of the biggest changes to the deal involves the name. Trump insisted the three countries use the name United States Mexico Canada Agreement or USMCA, replacing NAFTA. I mean, is that well, that seems like semantics, I'm sure. Uh, it's a good day for Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau told reporters after a late-night cabinet meeting to discuss the deal. In a joint statement, Canada and the United States said it would result in freer markets, fairer trade, and robust economic growth in our region. The global financial markets also liked the deal, largely because it removed the prospect of an all-out trade war between the U.S. and two of its biggest trading partners. The bigger issue is the positive impact on confidence and sentiment, O'Sullivan said. 
During the 2016 presidential campaign, Trump promised to rewrite NAFTA or leave the trade deal together, which is, yeah, that's very true. He did. Uh, Canada was initially left out of the deal when the U.S. and Mexico reached an agreement last month to revamp NAFTA. On August 31st, the Trump administration officially notified Congress of the deal with Mexico. That created a 90-day deadline that would allow outgoing Mexican president Enrique Peña Nieto to sign the updated agreement before he leaves office December 1st. Uh, yeah, no comments. Uh, autos. Uh, the most important provisions in DOP terms cover the auto industry, which has come to rely on a complex cross-border supply chain that moves billions of dollars worth of parts and components the factories located in all three countries. Trump's threats to revoke NAFTA entirely could have added a substantial cost uh, to that supply chain. Uh, raised showroom car prices or, or left, or wait, that motherfuckers, did you really? Raised showroom car prices or left some models unprofitable to manufacture. Yeah, somebody did a typo there. Uh, while the USMCA avoids tariffs, it will make it harder for global automakers to build cars cheaply in Mexico and is aimed at bringing more jobs into the United States. In August, Mexico agreed to provisions that would require that 40 to 45 percent of a car's parts and assemblies be built in countries where auto workers earn at least $16 an hour in order for car makers to qualify for NAFTA's duty-free benefits. Uh, oh God, this is a long one. In a concession to Mexican and Canadian companies, the final agreement hammered out Sunday largely exempts passenger vehicles, pickup trucks, and auto parts from possible Trump administration tariffs. If Trump imposes so-called Section 232 auto tariffs on national security grounds, Mexico and Canada would each get a tariff-free annual quota of 2.6 million passenger cars for export to the United States. That's well above their current export levels. Uh, pickup trucks built in both countries will be exempted entirely. If the U.S. does impose, tariff, oh, I'm sorry, impose tariffs, Mexico will also get an auto parts quota of $108 billion a year while Canada will get a parts quota of $32.4 billion annually. The deal sets a five-year transition period after the agreement enters into force for the regional value content, content requirement for audios to increase to 75% from the current 62.5%. The pact also requires that vehicle manufacturers source at least 70% of their steel and aluminum from within the three countries. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, dairy. Uh, Trump's biggest talking point, better access to Canadian markets for U.S. American dairy farmers, will likely to have the least impact in dollar terms. Canada reportedly agreed to give U.S. dairy farmers access to about 3.5% of its roughly $16 billion annual domestic dairy market. Under the deal, the Canadian government will be allowed to compensate dairy farmers hurt by the deal. Canada had agreed to open up wider access to dairy markets under the and specific partnership, which Trump drew from in January of 2017. Oh, goddamn. Trump will say the new USMCA widens U.S. access to Canada's dairy market beyond TT, uh, TPP levels. Uh, for its part, Canada won a key concession from the U.S., which agreed to preserve a trade dispute process that Ottawa pushed hard to maintain. Canada relies on the settlement process to protect its lumber producers from anti-dumping tariffs imposed by the U.S. The new agreement does limit the settlement process involving investor disputes to sectors that are dominated by state-run firms, including energy, telecom, and infrastructure companies. You know, I can I can read all of that in beautiful, uh, beautiful fucking fashion, but uh, 
all of that sounds like goddamn techno babble to me. Like it's it's, it's yeah. fucking Greek. <laughs> it's a, uh, one of the I think that article there even said that um, uh, the uh, the this trade deal leaves NAFTA largely intact. Which I don't know if that's true or not, but it's an interesting observation at least. <laughs> I mean, if they're if they're not fibbing, if 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 what now? Uh oh, what's happening? It's just NAFTA with stuff on top of it. Like, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so let me see here. Uh, so I, I was thinking, uh, you know, with um, all the stuff about Brexit and no deal or deal with the EU for the UK, uh, maybe mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that Trump decided to change the name from North American Free Trade Agreement to United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement is because he might be thinking about expanding the trade pact to include some other nations maybe not in, uh, you know, the North American continent. Um, and it would be very interesting if um, the so-called special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom led to the UK joining this trade pact as well, uh, which would really piss off a lot of the Remainers, <laughs> because then mm. they wouldn't be able to whine about the... Uh, you know, we're going to lose everything, we're going to, our jobs are going to tank, blah, 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 the economy's going to hell. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't fucking guess. <laughs> All right, then, uh, well, <clears throat> let's see, I'll take the next one. California um, has passed a new uh, bill, a uh, new law. California's tough net neutrality bill prompts a U.S. lawsuit. This is from ABC News. Uh, the article is by Jonathan J. Cooper of the Associated Press. Sacramento, California, September 30th, 2018. California Governor Jerry Brown signed the nation's toughest net neutrality measure Sunday, requiring internet providers to maintain a level playing field online. The move prompted an immediate lawsuit by the Trump administration. Advocates of net neutrality hope the new law in the home of the global technology industry will have national implications by pushing Congress to enact national net neutrality rules or encouraging other states to follow suit. But the U.S. Department of Justice wants to stop the law, arguing that it creates burdensome anti-consumer requirements that go against the federal government federal government's approach of deregulating the Internet. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions said in a statement, quote, once again, the California legislature has enacted an extreme and illegal state law attempting to frustrate federal policy, end quote. Law is the... the the law is the latest example of the nation's most populous state seeking to drive public policy outside its borders and rebuff President Donald Trump's agenda. Brown did not explain his reasons for signing the bill or comment on the federal lawsuit Sunday night. Supporters of the new law cheered it as a win for Internet freedom. It is set to take effect January 1st. Uh, let's see... <clears throat> Democratic Senator Scott Weiner, the law's author, said, quote, This is a historic day for California. A free and open Internet is a cornerstone of 21st century life. Our democracy, our economy, our health care, and public safety systems, and day-to-day -day activities, end quote. The Federal Communications Commission last year repealed rules that prevented Internet companies from exercising more control over what people watch and see on the Internet. Telecommunications companies lobbied hard to kill it or water it down, saying it would lead to higher internet and cell phone bills and discourage investments in faster internet. They say it's unrealistic to expect them to comply with internet regulations that differ from state to state. U.S. Telecom, a telecommunications trade group, said California writing its own rules will create problems. 
The group said in a Sunday statement, quote, rather than 50 states stepping in with their own conflicting open Internet solutions, we need Congress to step up with a national framework for the whole Internet ecosystem and resolve ecosystem, good gods, and resolve this issue once and for all, end quote. Net neutrality advocates worry that without rules, Internet providers could create fast lanes and slow lanes that favor their own states and apps or make it harder for consumers to see content from competitors that could limit consumer choice or shut out upstart companies that can't afford to buy access to the fast lane, critics say. The new law prohibits Internet providers from blocking or slowing data based on content or from favoring websites or video streams from companies that pay extra. It also bans zero rating, in which internet providers don't count certain content against a monthly data cap, generally video streams produced by the company's own subsidiaries and partners. Oregon, Washington, and Vermont have approved legislation related to net neutrality, but California's measure is seen as the most comprehensive attempt to codify the principle in a way that might survive a likely court challenge. An identical bill was introduced in New York. Um, <clears throat> And a note, Associated Press writers Eric Tucker and Mike Balsamo in Washington and Kathleen Gwinnain in Sacramento contributed to this report. So, I mean, certainly um, there has been a revelation that ISPs have, in fact, been throttling uh, people's access to YouTube, for example. Uh, this has been reported in connection with Comcast and Verizon and I don't know who else. And then there was this uh, incident uh, last month, I believe it was, it may have been late August, uh, but I think it was in September, uh, when uh, one of the ISPs uh, decided to make the fire department pay more in order to be un, uh, unthrottled as they were fighting some of the California wildfires, which is what led to a lot of outrage in California and demands that this law be passed and that uh, Governor Brown sign it into law. So, I mean, I, it is just Jeff Sessions, too. I mean, these people are uh, fucking crazy. Uh, what was it? Ted Cruz uh, referred to net neutrality as Obamacare for the Internet. And I'm like, do you even do you even use the internet, you dumb shit? Well, it's just a series of tubes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, hey, baby. Welcome <clears throat> home. So, <laughs> we're going over the recent news. Sorry, what? Uh, so, yeah, I said we're going over the recent news. My boyfriend is in the stream now with us. <clears throat> oh yeah, I, I noticed they, they hopped in, but they haven't said anything. Hello? Hello. Hello, friend. Yes, he's <laughs> using his silly name, Lord Flappy Hat. He's better known as Lunar 5 or Pepper. Um, and I know him as Matt, but that's my guy. Um, so oh. anyway, did you uh, have anything to say about this, uh, that neutrality thing? Uh, yes, Portland may actually sue Trump's FCC over new 5G tech rulings. Oh. Huh? Well, that's interesting. Huh. Well, that's what happens when the... Oh, what the hell happened? I just read the title. Well, uh, let's see. Hey. <laughs> The Portland City Council on Tuesday cleared the way for the city to sue Trump, the Trump administration, over new rules kneecapping the city's ability to recoup fees from telecom providers. By its actions and by its action Tuesday, the city council added a, a port, added Portland to a growing list of cities, primarily on the West Coast, that are preparing to fight Donald Trump's FCC over what official over what officials view as a needless freebie, freebie to cable company. Uh, the idiot mayor said, this is a property grab by the federal government. 
at the council meeting Tuesday and called for a last minute approval last called last yeah. said at the council meeting Tuesday called last minute to approve legal action. Whoever wrote this needs to be hit over the head. Well, we've had a lot of that tonight with uh, people with typos and poor grammar and skills. Yeah. What, what is the deal with them hiring people that can Right? I mean, they used to have editors. You can't, you can't form, like, a grammatically inc well, like, just <laughs> capitalization is wrong, word usage is wrong, tense is wrong in some cases. In the punctuation is fucked. Like, I, I was writing better than this when I was in high school, and I don't have, like, these people had to graduate college with a journal degree or a journalism degree or something like that to get these jobs. Like, suck my metaphorical cock with this, please. Like, Jesus. Jesus Christ. It makes me so mad sometimes reading this shit. Yeah, I mean. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know they used to have uh, something called editors who would, you know, proofread and make sure everything <laughs> was. Uh, yeah, I guess they don't uh, care to do that job anymore. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm I'm certainly for a net neutrality. Um, I've had issues with YouTube ever since about. A week or two after Ajit Pai got up uh, with his little shit-eating grin and announced that they were going to go ahead and do it anyway and fuck all of you people who said, we don't want you to do it. Um, so uh, you want to take the next article on uh, uh, the Elon Musk article? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, no. Am I not it, not it out? Oh, here we are. Sorry, I tried to... Okay, so so Nick just called me to try to do a direct of the, uh, like, the camera stuff to get the format set up. Oh. And meanwhile, I didn't realize I couldn't mute him. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, stop calling me Nick. I, like, I couldn't mute him, so he's talking, <laughs> and I'm trying to listen to you, and he's a loud motherfucker. You know he's a loud motherfucker. Well, tell so, him, like, he's supposed <laughs> to be watching this, too. I told him I was gonna have a very special guest host, co-hostess, and he right, would I, uh, I'm gonna just message Can't mute you, and I'm trying to listen to Giovanna... God, dang it! There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Yeah, I told him that I could put him on mute if he needed to censor the camera like that, but like, nigga, <laughs> that's all. Uh, boys will be boys, huh? I love him to death. He's my best friend, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Nick is a cool guy. I like him, obviously. I, uh, he's the best, but he's a hot mess. <laughs> he's supposed to be watching this stream. Nick, you're supposed to be watching the stream, dude. He's, he's trying to figure out how to set up saints right now and become one that usually does it. And he's like slightly technologically retarded. Like he, he needs he needs help. He needs a little help. Um, if I had better internet, I would just do it myself, set it up on OBS, and just host it on the Saints channel. Just because I have the the sign in information, just host it on the Saints channel. Do all the production myself. If I had better internet, because I can. But I don't. He has better internet than I do. But he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> like, the one time I hosted Saints from his place, and I tried to set it up, like, 
like 10 seconds before we were supposed to all go on and Jeff was the special surprise guest because he was the one that was out doing whatever it was calling in we ended up being like a half an hour late just because I couldn't figure out how to get shit to work yeah I know I know, my phone. I know what time it is uh, I couldn't get shit to work and there was just at a, uh, at a point where Nick literally called Jeff's phone and had him pick up and was freaking out because we couldn't just get it to broadcast at all. Mm-hmm. And Nick's freaking out and at one point. I remember, like, I am drunk. I am drunk. And at one point, I look him straight in the face and scream in his face going, Calm your fucking tits! <laughs> all right, Jeff. <laughs> Explain to me what you need me specifically to do to get this to work. And he explained it to me, and I did the thing and it broadcasted, but it, had it not fucked up as bad as it did initially, and me just losing my will to give a shit, uh, it would have gone off almost like an almost normal Saints episode, give or take some graphical differences and, and transition differences, because Jeff has all that already preloaded on his uh, OBS back at home. Uh, Nick said he's going to set it up in the way that he's going to set it up, uh, and I, I have a copy of the written out format currently, uh, so I'm going to try and keep everybody on task and see if we can actually do the Saints format, but just, like, he calls me just now, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to see, like, he's just going to need to, like, square the, the, uh, the video real quick to make sure, like, I'm in a box or whatever, and he's just fucking blabbing in my ear, and I realize Skype doesn't have a way to mute a motherfucker. <laughs> I can mute myself, but I can't mute him. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm trying to listen to you talk, and I can't hear you because you speak in a normal person's voice, and he speaks like somebody who's trying to get the world to hear him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well, well. Um, so uh, if you want to go ahead and take off and go over there and help him out, that's fine because the stream has ended, my cat jumped up and hit my uh, ethernet and knocked me out of connection with OBS, so theoretically it's still recording but the stream is already over and appears to have ended uh, Well, do you, do you upload the, uh, the recordings after? I will do that if it actually succeeds in recording <laughs> uh, I don't know because okay. it actually disconnected me from OBS twice as a result of the cat jumping on the on the ethernet um, thingy. so <laughs> Jesus um, <laughs> my goodness but yeah so, so sometimes mm. this happens um, <clears throat> oh shit happens yeah but tell Nick he was supposed to be watching and I'm very disappointed in him and you know shake your finger at him for me and stuff oh and if Jables uh, Jables was out in the uh, no someone in the um in the uh, in the external chat, there said yeah. it was Crab Ninety said, "Hey, are you trying to piss off Rimshi and Jables?" Devil King nineteen ninety four says, "I'm watching mm-hmm. both laugh out loud." And I said, "Tell Rimshi and Jables that I said we will bury you!" Exclamation point and banged my shoe on the <laughs> table. <laughs> That's funny because those are. St- <laughs> 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 they're 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 in the chat because of me, so <laughs> they're they're just they're trying to be funny. That's exactly what that is. And then Jables goes, got it, and subscribes to this channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah. So I mean, I, right, well, I don't know yeah. if everybody got the reference, but um, there was a an, an incident back in the fifties. Uh, where uh, Khrushchev was at, I think, the United Nations, and he was in some argument with uh, Eisenhower or, or the United, uh, United States ambassador to the UN or whatever, and he banged his shoe on the table and said, We will bury you. <laughs> oh, my. All right. Well, I, uh, I, I had fun. This was a good time. Cool, cool. Anytime you need me, just let me know. And we and could make I'll it a regular if I... thing if you wanted to, but I've got to do some stuff with my ISP and get them to stop fucking with me. Yeah, get get that shit together as much as you possibly can. I understand some areas aren't that great as far as, uh, as far as connection is concerned. Like, my, my internet is fucking shit. Like, if my roommates were home right now, 
I would be having like so much fucking issues. I'd have to start shutting all kinds of shit off and like yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna go uh, use the the ladies' room and then tell Nick that he can uh, try the Skype calls so that we can get everything <laughs> for for Saints tonight. Because otherwise, uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, he needs me. So <laughs> all right. All right, thanks okay. for helping out, and I'm going to continue to read in the hopes that this is actually still recording. Uh, so then, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and I hope I hope it is because yeah, it's good fun. All right, take care. Love you. Good night. All right, so the next article um, <clears throat> that I had to look at is um, is slightly older news, but it might be of interest to some of the audience. Um, and they may not have seen it. It's from last Saturday, the 29th. It is Elon Musk um, has been forced to step down as chairman of Tesla, but remains the CEO. Musk settles with, this is from The Verge by Sean O'Kane. Musk settles with the SEC just two days after being charged. Um... Elon Musk has reached a settlement with the Securities and Exchange Commission on the charges filed earlier this week over his abandoned attempt to take Tesla private. Musk will have to step down as the chairman of Tesla within 45 days and will not be able to take that role with the company again for three years. He will be able to remain Tesla's CEO during that time. Alongside the settlement, the SEC also charged Tesla with, quote, failing to have required disclosure controls and procedures relating to Musk's tweets, end quote. According to the agency, Tesla has already agreed to settle this charge. Both Musk and the company will pay separate $20 million fines that will, quote, be distributed to harmed investors under a court-approved process, end quote, according to the SEC. And Tesla is being made to appoint two new independent directors to its board. <clears throat> the company will also hire a lawyer to monitor Musk's communications, including his tweets, according to the agreement. Uh, let's see. Stephanie Avakian, co-director of the SEC's Enforcement Division, said in a statement, quote, The total package of remedies and relief announced today are specifically designed to address the misconduct at issue by strengthening Tesla's corporate governance and oversight in order to protect investors, end quote. The terms of the settlement closely mirror the deal that numerous outlets reported was on the table Thursday morning, which would have required a two-year chairman ban and a $10 million fine. The two sides were so close to agreeing to these terms, according to the New York Times, that press releases were even being drafted. Musk ultimately decided that he didn't want to go through with it, though, and later that day the SEC charged him with securities fraud. In addition to the other terms, Musk had to agree to a condition where he is not allowed to either, quote, admit nor deny, end quote, whether he was guilty of committing securities fraud, <clears throat> meaning that he cannot publicly state that he did nothing wrong, something that was reportedly a sticking point that caused Musk to walk away from the original deal. The SEC opened an investigation into Musk and Tesla in early August, shortly after the CEO abruptly announced on Twitter that he was considering taking the company private at a share price of $420. Musk said that he had the funding secured to pull off the feet and that support from investors was confirmed as well. While Musk reportedly had held multiple meetings with Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund about backing the privatization effort. The SEC argued in its lawsuit that Musk did not have a solid deal in place, and therefore his tweets were therefore... What the fuck? Why repeat therefore? Uh, were, and therefore his tweets were therefore, quote, false and misleading, and quote, to investors. Oh my god, this is horrible writing. I'm telling you, the agency wrote in its complaint, quote, Musk knew that he had never discussed a going private transaction at $420 per share with any potential funding source, had done nothing to investigate whether it would be possible for all current investors to remain with Tesla as a private company via a special purpose fund and had not confirmed support of Tesla's investors for a potential going private transaction, end quote. The first hearing in the SEC's case against Musk was scheduled for 
February, the Department of <coughs> the Department of Justice reportedly still has an open investigation into his failed privatization attempt, and a number of shareholders have sued Musk in court for losses resulting <coughs> from the alleged market manipulation. So there is that. And let's see what's next on the agenda. Um, oh, yes. This is a very interesting little article from uh, BBC the News. The whole thing about Tesla is it's not hard making cars in bulk. We've kind of figured this shit out already. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like he's designing anything <laughs> really new or whatever. I mean... Yeah. It's just the way he's going about it. I mean, t- when a car company wants to launch a new car model, they do more than just tell the engineers and designers, hey, here's this new car model. Go make it. Mm-hmm. They also have to think about how we're going to build this, how it's going to fit its existing assembly lines, and if it doesn't, what, ne- what we need to modify. They also need to train the workers on how to make the new car model. This is pretty standard stuff. What Tesla does is they make it on the fly, which is terrible. Because they start out with a general idea, then they figure out the everything else so when they start producing. Right, I mean, right. This is great if you want to make a piece of software, because software is easy to alter at low cost. Well, relatively low cost. Not so much when we're talking about cars. Okay, so the next article that I had um, to look at is a very interesting little piece from um, the BBC News. Um, <clears throat> just one second here. Someone mad with the whole Tesla's not doing anything new comment. Uh, oh, well, it really isn't. I mean, they are doing the uh, electric battery stuff. They've apparently extended life of the battery and so forth. But anyway, uh, next next article that I have to talk about is uh, an interesting little piece from the BBC News. It turns out that there may have been a hunter-gatherer society in the Konkan Highlands of western Maharashtra near Mumbai, India, previously unknown to historians and archaeologists, as petroglyphs tentatively dated to 10,000 BCE suggest. It's Atlantis. No. Uh, prehistoric art hints at lost Indian civilization. Uh, <clears throat> and the discovery of rock carvings believed to be tens of thousands of years old in India's western state of Maharashtra has greatly excited archaeologists who believe they hold clues to a previously unknown civilization. BBC Marathi Mayuresh Connor reports. The rock carvings known as petroglyphs have been discovered in their thousands atop hillocks in the Konkan region of western Maharashtra, mostly discovered in the Ratnagiri and Rajapur areas. A majority of the images etched on the rocky flat hilltops remained unnoticed for thousands of years. Most of them were hidden beneath layers of soil and mud, but a few were in the open. These were considered holy and worshipped by locals in some areas. The sheer variety of the rock carvings have stunned experts. Animals, birds, human figures, and geometrical designs are all depicted. There's one that looks a, a bit like a shark to me. The way the petroglyphs have been drawn, and their similarity to those found in other parts of the world, have led experts to believe that they were created in prehistoric times and are possibly among the oldest ever discovered. Uh, uh, <coughs> Tejas Gar- Garge Uh, told the BBC, uh, uh, he's he's the director of the Maharashtra State Archaeology Department, Tejas Garge, told the BBC, quote, our first deduction from examining these petroglyphs is that they were created around 10,000 BC. 
end quote. The credit for their discovery goes to a group of explorers led by Sudhir Rispud and Manoj Marathi, who began searching for the images in earnest after observing a few in the area. Many were found in village temples and played a part in local folklore. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Rispud, Rispud told the BBC, quote, We walked thousands of kilometers, people started sending photographs to us, and we even enlisted schools in our efforts to find them. We made students ask their grandparents and other village elders if they knew about any other engravings. This provided us with a lot of valuable information, end quote. Together they found petroglyphs in and around 52 villages in the area, but only around five villages were aware that the images even existed. Apart from actively searching for them, Mr. Rispud and Mr. Marave have also played an important role in documenting the petroglyphs and lobbying authorities to get involved in studying and preserving them. Mr. Garge says the images appear to have been created by a hunter-gatherer community which was not familiar with agriculture. Um, <clears throat> quote, we have not found any pictures of farming activities, but the images depict hunted animals, and there's detailing of animal farm forms, so this man knew about animals and sea creatures that indicates he was dependent on hunting for food, end quote. Dr. Shrikant Pradhan, a researcher and art director at Poonstekan College, who has studied the petroglyphs closely, said that the art was clearly inspired by things observed by people at the time. And the BBC has misspelled college as collage. Jesus Christ. Most of uh, Mr. Gar Mr. Garge adds, quote, most of the petroglyphs uh, show familiar animals. There are images of sharks, yeah, I was right, and whales, as well as amphibians like turtles, end quote. But this begs the question of why some of the petroglyphs depict animals like rhinoceroses and hippos, which aren't found in India. Did the people who created them migrate to India from Africa, or were those animals once found in India? The state government has set aside a fund of 240 million rupees, which is $3.2 million or 2.5 million British pounds, to further study 400 of the identified petroglyphs. It is hoped that some of these questions will eventually be answered. There are a number of photographs of these petroglyphs at the website, and assuming that this portion of the recording survives the disconnection from OBS, I will certainly be including uh, links to all of these articles in the video description. Moving on then, <coughs> pharmaceutical prices continue to be of concern in the U U.S. Uh, this is from, uh, what is this? Uh, this is from, uh, oh shit, I've opened it in the wrong, in the wrong program. Uh, let me see. I'm going to get it in a different program so it's properly sized for me to read it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so this says people protest insulin. This is from uh, WTHR Channel 13, NBC affiliate uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, people protest insulin prices outside Eli Lilly. Uh, this is by Anna Carrera, Anna Carrera, um, published September 30th, and updated on the 1st of October. Uh, Indianapolis WTHR people came to Indianapolis from across the country to protest the price of insulin. They chanted and waved signs outside the main building of Eli Lilly on Saturday afternoon. Those we talked with say insulin costs are growing and they feel like companies are putting profits over people. One woman told us balancing medical costs uh, has turned into a life or death decision. Um, Karen Wolford, who has type 1 diabetes and came to the protest from Georgia, said, quote, It's $1,300 a month for me, and there are people who can't buy it. So there are people who are rationing. They're cutting their life short, whether it be right now or whether it be years down the road. So this is a very critical fight that needs to happen right now, end quote. A.J. Sinha, who lives in Indianapolis, says, quote, I have many patients that are type 1 diabetics. I'm a kidney doctor, so diabetes is one of the leading causes of kidney failures. 
uh, kidney failure requiring dialysis in this country, adequate access to life-saving medicines contributes to the effects that ravages people's lives and kill them, end quote. Kelly Murphy, the senior director of corporate communications for Eli Lilly, sent a statement to Eyewitness News, quote, Engagement on this issue is very important, and demonstrations are one way to have your voice heard. It will take continued effort and commitment across the healthcare system to affect change, and Lilly is committed to finding ways to help people who use insulin. Our Lilly Diabetes Solution Center helpline, which has helped approximately 2,500 people save in meaningful ways on insulin since opening in August, is one way we are providing help for people across the U.S. U.S. Uh, uh, Lily has been a, an active participant in the insulin access dialogue for a long time, and that work will continue. In the last 18 months, we have introduced a number of initiatives to help reduce the amount people pay at the pharmacy and provide access to lower-income people with diabetes. We are committed to continuing this work, end quote. So, hmm. And then moving on. <clears throat> in additional terrible news, the, the so-called brain-eating amoeba found in some waters in Texas has taken the life of a 29-year-old surfer. Um, <clears throat> so this is from CBS News and AP uh, from the 30th of September. Surfer dies from brain-eating amoeba after visiting Waco, Texas resort. A 29-year-old surfer, Fabrizio Stabile, 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 yeah, uh, who recently visited a Waco, Texas resort, has died from what is commonly referred to as a brain-eating amoeba. Our, as a BSR Cable Parks Surf Resort is closed, while the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention (CDC) tests for Neglaria fowleri, a rare but highly deadly amoeba. CBS affiliate KBTX TV reports. Kelly Crane, a spokesperson for Waco McLennan County Public Health District, uh, said, quote, The CDC collected water samples and are currently investigating to find the source. We hope to have results by the end of the week, end quote. The owner of the, result, uh, the, owner of the resort, Stuart E. Parsons, Jr., said he will continue to comply with requests related to the investigation of Stabile's death, uh, who died in New Jersey earlier this month after falling ill with Neglaria fowleri. Parsons said Stabile had been in the park's wave pool. An obituary in the press of Atlantic City describes Stabile as an avid outdoorsman who loved fishing, surfing, and snowboarding. Parsons said, quote, Our hearts and prayers are with his family, friends, and the New Jersey surf community during this difficult time, end quote. He said that the surf resort is in compliance with the CDC's guidelines and recommendations concerning Neglaria fowleri. The surf resort has been closed pending the test results from the CDC. He said it's unclear if the park remained closed Sunday morning and the CDC did not immediately respond to the Associated Press's call seeking uh, information on whether others who visited could have Neglaria fowleri. The CDC says people are typically infected when they go diving or swimming in warm freshwater places. Normally, people are infected when contaminated water enters through their nose, according to the agency. <clears throat> and um, so, uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> this obnoxious amoeba has spread to Louisiana now. Uh, according to the USA Today Network, uh, an article uh, originally published in the Shreveport Times by Nick Wooten, on uh, the 28th of September, brain-eating amoeba found in Louisiana water system. A portion of a water system in Louisiana has tested positive for a brain-eating amoeba, uh, according to the operator of the water system. Andy Freeman, the operator of Sligo Water System, said residents in South Bossier Parish, uh, southeast of Shreveport, may be affected. The Louisiana Department of Health conducted a random test of the system last week and notified the system of the positive result Friday, Freeman said. Sligo had purchased the water that tested positive for the amoeba from Bossier City. Sligo has 
disconnected from Bazier City Water and is now using well water to supply those customers, Freeman said. Other Sligo testing sites did not have the amoeba, Freeman said. Sligo uh, already was concerned about chlorine levels, so it began flushing the affected portion of the water Wednesday, Freeman said. The water system has been instructed to initiate a free chlorine burn for the next 60 days. The state has not issued a boil water order, Freeman said. The amoeba Nigleria or Nigleria fowleri is commonly found in warm fresh water and soil. It usually infects people when it enters the body through the nose and later the brain. You cannot get infected by swallowing the water. Attempts to contact Tracy Landry, a Bossy City spokesperson, were not successful before publication. Sligo normally serves water users with well water, but dry conditions had prompted it to buy Bossy City water, Freeman said. Hmm. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's delightful. Fortunately, not all the recent news is bad or scary. In a win for privacy rights, the U.S. failed to force Facebook to tap voice calls in Facebook Messenger. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Uh, booty, booty, booty. Hmm. So, apparently, I don't have that article handy right now. Oh, no, 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 I don't see it, so I don't know where it is. So I'm just going to go on to the next article. Uh, and there is more good news, which is a bit mixed in its actual effects. Amazon, yes, that Amazon has finally agreed to raise its workers' wages to $15 an hour. Now, this is... Uh, if... if, if minimum wage, if minimum wage had kept pace with the cost of living, it would now be at $22 in most states and 25 or higher in some states where the cost of living is higher. Um, so $15 really is not a living wage, uh, but of course it's closer <laughs> to a living wage than what they have been being paid. Unfortunately, not only did Bezos agree to raise minimum wage for his workers to fifteen dollars? Uh, but he also cut their stock options and some other benefits. Um, <clears throat> so this is an article from CNN. Uh, it's by Daniel Weiner Bronner and Chris Isidore, uh, published October second. Amazon is raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour for all U.S. employees. The change takes effect November 1st and applies to full-time, part-time, and temporary workers. Amazon says the $15 minimum wage will benefit more than 250,000 Amazon employees plus 100,000 seasonal workers. Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder and CEO, said, quote, We listened to our critics, thought hard mm. about what we wanted to do, and decided we want to lead. We're excited about this change and encourage our competitors and other large employers to join us, end quote. The change applies to Whole Foods and all other subsidiary employees. Amazon also said its public policy team will begin lobbying for an increase in the federal minimum wage, which has been $7.25 <clears throat> which has been seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour since two thousand nine. Um Dave Clark, the company's senior vice president of worldwide operations, told CNN's Christine Romans, quote, we'll leave it to Congress and professionals to decide what the right number is, but for us, that number is $15, end quote. The size and explosive growth of Amazon give the decision importance for far beyond the hundreds of thousands of people who will benefit directly. Amazon is among the largest employers in the United States, and it has added more American jobs in the past decade than any other company. The decision also raises the stakes for potential workers at Amazon's next headquarters. The company is planning to create a second headquarters known as HQ2 with as many as 50,000 jobs. 
Amazon has named 20 cities as finalists, including Atlanta, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. Critics, including independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, have said that Amazon does not pay workers enough. They have drawn a contrast with Bezos' spectacular wealth. He is the richest person alive, worth an estimated $165 billion, that's billion with a B, $165 billion. Sanders said on Tuesday, quote, I want to give credit where credit is due. I want to congratulate Mr. Bezos for doing exactly the right thing, end quote. He said he looked forward to working with Bezos to push for a $15 federal minimum wage. Bezos responded by thanking the senator, quote, we're excited about this and also hope others will join in, end quote. He wrote in a tweet. Um, and so the, uh, oh, and, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's it. Um, <clears throat> workers across the country have pushed for a $15 minimum wage, most notably as part of the movement known as Fight for $15. Supporters say it's a remedy for widening wage inequality and will boost consumer spending, while opponents countered that it could reduce opportunities for employment, particularly for teenagers and others looking for entry-level or low-skilled jobs. Some companies have responded to the public pressure. Target raised its minimum wage for new hires to $12 an hour in September and plans to raise its minimum to $15 by the end of 2020. Disney reached a deal with its unions to pay a minimum of $15 an hour at Disneyland in California in 2019 and at Disney World in Florida by 2021. And Walmart, the country's largest private sector employer, which has more than 1 million U.S. workers raised its minimum wage to $11 in February. Clark said that Amazon wanted to make its change sooner. He told Romans, quote, We decided, why wait? We should really do this now, end quote. Paul Son, a state policy uh, program director for the National Employment Law Project, said Amazon's announcement would put pressure on other companies to raise pay and on Congress to lift the national minimum. 29 states have their own minimum wages higher than the federal $7.25 an hour. Neil Saunders, managing director of the consultancy Global Data Retail, said that higher minimum pay could also help Amazon recruit workers. Uh, <clears throat> he said, quote, Without a rise in wages, Amazon would be placing itself at a disadvantage in the labor market. Uh, End quote. The company's rapid growth requires, quote, a lot of recruitment, uh, which is becoming increasingly difficult in a tight labor market. This is especially so over the holiday season, end quote. Saunders added that the decision was politically savvy. Last month, Amazon said that the average hourly wage for a full-time associate in its fulfillment centers was already more than $15 per hour. Amazon medium pay last year was... $28,446, according to a company filing that comes to $13.68 an hour. The company noted that the figure includes international and part-time employees. The company also announced that it is increasing the minimum wage for UK employees starting November the 1st. The new minimum wage is £10.50, pence, or $13.60, for the London area and 9 pounds 50 pence or twelve dollars and thirty cents for the rest of the country more than 37,000 employees including seasonal workers will be affected by the change the current uk minimum wage for adults over 25 is seven pounds 83 pence or ten dollars and fifteen cents um cnn money's lydia de pillis contributed to this report so then uh, let's see uh and finally uh, a bit of, I don't really know how to describe this, but um, uh, this is from <clears throat> uh, this is from the LA Times. The bus boy who tried to help a wounded Robert F. Kennedy in 1968 dies. His life was haunted by the violence. This is by Steve Lopez, uh, published on the 3rd of October, 2018. Juan Romero struggled for decades with a memory he could not escape. 
He left Los Angeles and moved to Wyoming, later came back west and settled in San Jose, raised a family and devoted himself to construction work. But still, he was haunted by what happened just after midnight, June 5, 1968, when he was on duty as a busboy at the Ambassador Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard near Koreatown. That was the night an assassin took aim at Robert F. Kennedy, a candidate for President of the United States. Romero, just 17 at the time, squatted next to the fallen U.S. Senator, cradled Kennedy's head, and tried to help him before realizing how gravely wounded Kennedy was. The photos of that moment with confusion and despair on Romero's young, dark eyes made for searing portraits of 1960s upheaval and followed by two months the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and by five years, the assassination of RFK's brother, President John F. Kennedy. It was only in recent years that Romero began to let go, and in my visits with him three years ago and again this past June, he seemed to have been revived. Finally, he said he was able to mark his birthday after years of refusing to celebrate it because it was in the same month as RFK's assassination that only made the news of Romero's death this week in Modesto at age 68 seem all the more tragic. Um... His longtime friend, TV newsman Rico Chacon of San Jose, said, quote, He had a heart attack several days ago, and his brain went too long without oxygen. He passed away on Monday morning, end quote. A niece and a brother confirmed Romero's death, but family members were unavailable for comment. Romero had not been ill, Chacon said. When I met with Romero in June... On the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's death, he told me he loved the hard, sweaty work of paving driveways and roads, and he had no intention of retiring. His marriage had failed many years earlier, but he said he was in regular contact with his children from that marriage, and he was giddy about a new romance with a modesto woman. That day, we met at a downtown San Jose park near a monument to Kennedy. The candidate had spoken there not long before his death and told throngs of supporters that poverty and illiteracy were indecent, and he warned of, quote, an erosion of a sense of national decency, end quote. Romero was in the habit of leaving flowers at that monument each year to mark RFK's death. In our many conversations over the years, he said that he often felt we were moving further politically from what he saw as a Kennedy legacy of tolerance and compassion. When I met Romero, Romero in uh, 1998, just before the 30th anniversary of the, assassination, of the assassination, he fell apart in recalling the fateful night and how he happened to be in the hotel pantry area where Kennedy was shot. <clears throat> Romero had told me he had met uh, Kennedy the night before when the candidate ordered room service and he felt honored by the way Kennedy shook his hand firmly and looked him in the eye with respect. Romero said, quote, I remember walking out of that room feeling 10 feet tall, feeling like an American, end quote. He had moved to Los Angeles from Mexico seven years earlier. He became an ambassador busboy on the advice of his strict stepfather, who worked at the hotel and wanted Romero to be sure to stay out of trouble on the streets of East Los Angeles. The next night, after Kennedy won California's Democratic primary and made a victory speech, he retreated through the kitchen pantry area, and Romero pushed through the crowd to congratulate him. He said that just as he shook Kennedy's hand, the shots were fired. Romero thought that the pops were for, from firecrackers and that Kennedy had fallen in fright, but Romero then saw blood spilling onto his own hand and realized what had happened as Sirhan Sirhan, the man with the gun, was apprehended. Romero said he was carrying rosary beads in his pocket and stuffed them into Kennedy's hands. Romero was taken to the Rampart Police Station for questioning, then took a bus to Roosevelt High the next morning. He still had Kennedy's blood on his hand and said he chose not to wash it off. As if the experience wasn't traumatic enough, Romero said he got letters from people congratulating him for, for what he did that made him uncomfortable, and so did letters from people asking him why he didn't do something to prevent the assassination. He got tired of being asked by ambassador guests to pose for photographs, found work in Wyoming, then made his home in San Jose. 
In 2010, I met up with Romero in Washington and went to, with him to Arlington National Cemetery, where RFK is buried. He said he wanted to pay his respects to tell Kennedy he had tried to live a life of tolerance and humility and to apologize. His buddy Chacon and I told him he had nothing to apologize for, but Romero knelt at the grave, spoke softly, and wept. Five years later, Romero emailed me to say he was finally feeling better with the help of a friend he had met on Facebook. She told him that when, he, when she looked at the photos from the ambassador, she saw a brave young man who tried to help someone who'd been hurt, even as others retreated. I heard from former California First Lady Maria Shriver, a niece of Bobby Kennedy, after I wrote that column. She said she wanted an address to send a thank you note to Romero. Uh, she told me Wednesday evening when I called her with the news of Romero's death, quote, I always felt a great deal of empathy for him because of how difficult it was for him to move past that, end quote. She said she never met Romero, but hoped he came to realize he did the humane thing in a tragic moment, and she hoped he had found peace in the end. Quote, God bless him. It's kind of hard to know why someone gets put into a situation that they're locked in forever. But as I see it, he was locked into an image of helping someone, end quote. So, That is all the time I have for this week, uh, assuming <laughs> that this uh, is actually still recording. Um, for Republic News, this is Liviana signing off. Until next time, have fun, but stay safe.